Welcome to Seven Figure Small, the podcast that brings you the stories and strategies that are driving the growing number of solo businesses achieving seven figures in revenue without investors or employees. If you want to discover what's behind the rise in these seven figure businesses, then you need to get our free Next Level 7 audio course. In this enlightening course from unemployable founder Brian Clark, you'll hear what's working right now for attracting an audience, discovering what they want to buy, and building your perfect business. To sign up for free, go to nextlevel7.com. That's nextlevel7.com. And now, here is your host for this edition of Seven Figure Small, me, Jared Morris. The global economy is in bad shape right now. That is perhaps the understatement of the century. On May 15th, the Associated Press reported that retail sales were down by a record 16.4% from March to April. It is by far the biggest drop that has been seen since these numbers have been tracked. Year over year, retail sales are down 21.6%. This is to be expected after eight weeks of social distancing and sheltering in place at home, but that doesn't make it any less staggering or devastating. But would you believe it if I told you that not all sectors of the economy are suffering? That same AP report says the following, quote, a longstanding migration of consumers toward online purchases is accelerating, with that segment posting an 8.4% monthly gain. Measured year over year, online sales surged 21.6%, unquote. You heard that right. Retail sales are down 21.6% over the last 12 months, while online sales are up 21.6%. In the span of eight weeks, it feels like there has been a tectonic shift, and no one knows with any certainty what the new normal is going to look like whenever it mercifully arrives. What we do know, because we learned it during the financial crisis of 2008 and in many examples prior, is that the businesses that will survive this economic turmoil and possibly even thrive on the other side of it are those that are able to adapt to the changing economic reality. In other words, those with a defensible business model. In this episode of Seven Figure Small, Brian Clark defines what a defensible model is, uses examples like Airbnb, Uber, and Amazon to illustrate it, and explains how it applies to building a seven-figure small business that is audience first as opposed to product first. This episode of Seven Figure Small is brought to you by Next Level 7, Brian Clark's free audio course that teaches you how to start stacking the building blocks of a defensible business. Most notably, you'll learn what's working for attracting an audience and discovering what they want to buy, which are the first steps toward building a business that truly has the ability to adapt to changing times. To get started for free, go to nextlevel7.com. That's nextlevel7.com. And now, this week's conversation with Brian Clark. So what's been on your mind lately, Brian? Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff on my mind, uh, as with everyone else in the uh, current situation. But to take my mind off of some of the more frustrating (laughs) aspects of life. (laughs) Which we just talked about for 20 minutes, but won't be including in the uh, final podcast. (laughs) I I really do think we need our pre-show conversations (laughs) to go live. Uh, People be like, wow, (laughs) damn, those guys are pissed off. (laughs) 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 But no, this is the kinder, gentler version of Jared and Brian. And, uh, but no, seriously, um, just for, you know, from a business standpoint, um, I am looking at how the pandemic is, you know, basically just obliterated so many businesses uh, because of the lack of uh, human contact by necessity and how certain other businesses are, are doing fine or adapting and others are thriving. Now, I guess the most defensible business at a local level, especially if you live in Boulder, are liquor stores and marijuana dispensaries because they got deemed essential. Because think about it. If you're going to get people to stay home, they're going to need to be drunk and high, you know, <laughs> to, to yeah. swallow that. And I think some of the people who are, are discontent uh, just aren't drinking enough, I guess. I don't know. 
No, but and part of that reason was also to not create a black market, right? Wasn't that well, part of the reasoning there? There's all sorts of reasons. I mean, obviously, alcohol withdrawal is a real thing, you know. So if you just shut it off, some people would get very sick. Uh, some people use marijuana medicinally. So I, I think it was well reasoned, but it was amazing because I talked to someone at the time when it wasn't clear if the liquor stores were going to stay open in Boulder because Denver closed theirs for like two days and everyone lost their minds. And so they reversed it. But uh, in the time uh, before we knew what would happen in Boulder on that issue, uh, one owner of of an establishment uh, said they did a month's worth of business in two days. So they literally could have just shut up shop right then and taken the rest of the time off. Um, but of course they've, they've all stayed open. So they're killing it, but that is a very, very rare exception. And that's just, you know, very specific to this situation. Um, I'm much more interested in defensible businesses, defensible business models in the broader sense, meaning adaptable, I guess. And, and within the control of the owner. And of course, as the, you know, proponents of the seven figure small kind of methodology, uh, usually that's, you know, a single or owner or a very small team working with contractors. So there's a whole lot of flexibility there, but only if you're not hamstrung by elements beyond your control and, and to the degree that that's possible, I find it very interesting. One thing that uh, at the big company level has been kind of interesting to see all the analysts debate about is Netflix versus Disney. So, of course, Disney is the old world media powerhouse. Netflix is regarded as a technology firm, and it's a platform for media, generally not their own, although, of course, we know that Netflix has gotten heavily into producing, uh, you know, original content themselves, which, like the rest of Hollywood, is on hold. However, Netflix is killing it because their subscriptions have gone up astronomically with everyone stuck at home. Disney saw something similar. They've already met their goals with uh, Disney+, Plus, something like 50 million subscribers, way ahead of schedule. Wow. But... Disney overall is in trouble because movie theaters are closed. And think about a theme park, Jared. I find them horrid under any circumstances, but you know, who's going to go back to a theme park anytime soon? I don't know. That doesn't seem like a good idea. So in that sense, Disney is defensible in that they're diversified um, and they launched Disney plus just in time. So Imagine what uh, a fuss it'll make in the movie theater world, even though they're basically shut down. If Marvel goes, you know what? We're going to release Black Widow online first, Disney Plus. The Marvel people who aren't already signed up are going to flock to the platform, right? Mm -hmm. So that may be a a big change. You know, we may finally see uh, the power the movie theaters have had over, uh, you know, over distribution kind of come to an end. Not that there will be no movie theaters, but they won't be able to control how films are are released in the future. Why? Because look at Netflix, they're killing it. So um, that's a, a big company type example here that just serves to provide some, you know, some fodder for in, uh, analysis, I guess, if you will. Um, and And this is all really, Uh, beyond Netflix, we've got this broader trend of what they're calling virtuality, which means digital, which means online, right? Everyone, again, has to stay home. So online use, the traffic in the last couple months has just been greatly accelerated what was already happening. And that's a shift to an online economy. Now we have of course a vast online economy. I've been participating in it for 20 years um, 14 years since copy blogger, right? So it's around, but I think those of us who live in it don't realize how many people don't live in it. And I think the surge we're seeing is a good indication of how many people do not live online as much as we do, but now they're starting to. 
Now, most analysts expect that surge to fade after the pandemic. You know, it's not like everyone's going to stay jacked in when they can go back out. But the overall base of digital online economic use is going to rise. And again, this is something that was already happening and the pandemic has accelerated that change. And I think that's a common theme. It was going to happen over a course of time, but in the course of two months, we saw an acceleration. I've seen some uh, CEOs say it's accelerated 10 years because uh, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. For one, as we'll get into, uh, companies that were putting off our automation and AI because they were too busy to make it happen just had an incentive, frankly, to eliminate the human element as much as possible. I mean, it's it was going to happen anyway, but now it's happening faster. Yeah, you know, and the other thing that's interesting, you said it it's accelerated almost you know, 10 years, it's like, instead of the, you know, the drip, 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 like, oh, you know, here's the new Christmas present for this year and people get it. And it changes these habits a little bit. Like it's all happening at once. And it's a long enough time that people and their families are actually developing habits. Like it's going to be, I mean, I agree with you. Obviously once everything opens up, people will go back to doing some of the stuff they, they like, but there's some, some habits being created with how people consume stuff, how people shop, how people live that, are going to start to be ingrained, you know, the longer people are spending at home. And it's going to be interesting to see how that all unwinds once, you know, things go back to whatever the new normal is. Yeah. So, like anecdotally, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, from people in Boulder who were kind of against online shopping because they really wanted to support local businesses. It's a very Boulder kind of thing. Yeah. But it, it's probably common among people uh, in all areas and walks of life. But then they were forced to use Amazon, you know, out of necessity, and they they love it. They they're like, oh my god, I can't believe how great it is to be. Able, as soon as you think of something, you press a button, and then it shows up in a couple of days. You know, even with the uh, the shipping uh, problems that have happened due to volume, it's still the reason why a lot of us have been using Amazon for quite a, a long time, right? So that and uh, people who were adamantly opposed to video conferencing are now on Zoom with their friends. Yeah, you're right. Habits are being created. But more over, I think there are some the resistance that people had to a certain behavior. Once they try it, they realize that they actually like it. And that's a, an accelerating habit right there. Yeah. I mean, the service of Amazon is incredible. It's the externalities that are... <laughs> That are the problem when it comes to Amazon. Exactly. But hold right. that thought because I know we want to get to Amazon. But what, there are other examples. You know, you talked about Netflix and Disney. What are some others that are, you know, kind of showing this? Well, two of the major uh, change agents, if you will, after uh, the Great Recession of two thousand eight. Uh, that what sprung out of that were two very innovative companies, Airbnb and Uber right? Now, Airbnb has just been wrecked because the broader travel industry has been wrecked. I mean, that goes way beyond Airbnb and the people they've had to lay off. I thought their CEO did a really good job under tough circumstances when having to let go a substantial amount of staff. Um, But the broader impact on travel is just monumentally huge, in, in re- regard to our broader economy, um, I'm worried that my travel habit that I've developed over the last four years has just been cut off, and that causes me some concern. But um, so Airbnb was, you know, this uh, application that uh, allowed people with uh, real estate that they owned or controlled could uh, connect with people who wanted short term, you know, rentals of that real estate, right? So you had this entire industry of people, you know, beyond the spare bedroom or beyond uh, your vacation home when you weren't using it. People were buying real estate uh, to participate in the Airbnb ecosystem. They relied on someone else's platform uh, and yet beyond the dangers of doing that in other contexts have taken out huge mortgages, right? And now you're seeing... 
uh, complaints that they can't they can't pay their mortgages because they can't get any uh, tenants in short term or long term. Of course, most people are not that sympathetic to them. I, I've seen some pretty <laughs> nasty responses, which is too bad you screwed up. Um, and I think that's somewhat fair, but uh, I think the real problem is deeper than than that. Uber, on the other hand, is also hurting Lyft as well uh, because. You know, by necessity, people are going less places. They don't want to be in a car with a stranger in a strange environment. All of that makes sense. But Uber just got caught uh, by a pandemic too soon because their model, and, and they're not even shy about saying it, is to get rid of all the human drivers and have an autonomous fleet. That technology was supposed to start really... um happening this year, I think. And, and the pandemic actually put the brakes on being able to deploy and test as much uh, as is needed for autonomous vehicles. But in the broader sense, the race toward automation and artificial intelligence is accelerating. So at some point, Uber will have autonomous cars, no humans involved. And guess what? Do you think consumers... And business people are going to be more receptive of that now or less? More. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't like my Uber driver talking to me, but infecting me is a whole different issue. So again, uh, Uber will get there. They will survive. Airbnb, I worry about because uh, there are many things that can disrupt the travel industry. You've Obviously, pandemics, we've seen what can happen there but you've got terrorism, you've got war, you've got an increasing uh, nationalism over uh, the, the globalism that allowed for this unrestricted free travel, you know, the, and fueled many an Instagram account with uh, the, <laughs> all the <laughs> wonderful pictures of your, your wonderful travel life. Um, so that's an interesting analysis to go through, you know, the difference between these two companies that kind of sprung out of uh, you know, the need of people uh, to uh, participate in what's been called the gig economy, right? So people started renting out rooms to make extra cash. People started driving people around to make extra cash. cash. But then people became full-time drivers and other people started investing in real estate, relying on Airbnb to pay those mortgages. And that's the primary theme of what we're talking about here is, which is it is incredibly dangerous to rely on someone else's platform. Now, you know, Jared, we've been talking about this for over a decade, right? Mainly in the context that uh, we used to sell at Copyblogger software for web publishing, hosting, uh, all of these things that you use to build your own uh, platform on the web. And we were just constantly saying, man, bad things will happen from the people who relied on a Facebook page instead of a website. Facebook wipes them out. People who relied on Tumblr, people who uh, it, it kept happening over and over and over again. So there was never uh, a loss of opportunity for us to say, hey, you really need your own website, right? And I'm out of that business now and I'll still tell you exactly the same thing. You know, you talked about Uber and their transition to basically doing business without human drivers. And this this kind of brings us back to Amazon because, you know, just in the last couple of days there have been all these stories and tweets about how Jeff Bezos is on track to be a trillionaire, which just kind of makes you drop your jaw. I mean, it's just it's mind-boggling. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, the the, the externalities that are created by Amazon's model and, you know, one of the the benefits I suppose in this current situation is you know, Amazon's one of those companies that is growing, so they're hiring. I mean, they need people, you know, who are drivers. They need people who are working in the warehouses. But I mean, if Uber is going to be going to human drivers, how far are we from Amazon doing the same thing? And then, you know, I mean, you know, eliminating all of those people that are relying on them for jobs. I mean, that has to be something that's going to be coming down the road before too long, right? Yeah, so Amazon was already a juggernaut and Bezos was already the world's richest man. And then the pandemic hits and no one can shop anywhere in the real world. 
I mean, I was surprised to find that Target's still open. I'm not going in Target. That just sounds like a nightmare to me. But they're open uh, and they're not really changing anything. <laughs> at least a lot of the Targets yeah. I've been in. And I, I'm a so. Target guy. You know, I'm not a Walmart guy. I'm a Target guy. But um, the the thought of going shopping is just if when I don't have to. I mean, most of the time I was using mm-hmm. Amazon already. I don't. I become less and less a fan of their business practices. And that's a conundrum, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you added up all the money I've spent at Amazon in the last 20 years, it's a lot of money. Um, but, okay, so th- this is what happens uh, when traditional retail closes. Amazon is the beneficiary. And then we hear news of, you know, it, we've got all these people being laid off, but Amazon is hiring 100,000 people or whatever it is. But that's for now. Now, never mind the fact that we know that working conditions, especially in the warehouses, is terrible, right? So you've got desperate people who need jobs and they're taking them at a company who is, you know, known to treat people badly. And then, of course, you've got all these hardworking delivery drivers, UPS, FedEx, uh, United States Postal Service. Man, they're out on the front lines bringing us our damn stuff. Um, but yeah, you're right. Amazon is already in process. Again, they're not shy about it. Uh, right now, they're saying, well, our robots uh, cooperate with our human staff. Um, they've already floated the idea of dr- drone delivery. So that last mile from the local Amazon uh, warehouse facility uh, delivered to your house by a flying robot, basically. Sounds like science fiction, but it, we have the tech right now, you know. And again, Amazon has every motivation to accelerate the shift away from the human element because the human element is frail when you have things, again, beyond pandemics, uh, terrorism, uh, d- just social disruption of any kind. Um, you got to think Bezos is looking there. Now, the reason why he's probably going to end up being a trillionaire is this whole the vaccine supply chain thing that he's got. I, I got to give the guy is brilliant, but he, he could be a little nicer, a lot nicer. You just, know what I'm saying? Just tell. Yeah, how much money do you need? <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But but here, man, Jared, it gets really worse. So let's let's talk more about our people here, people who, uh, you know, are in business maybe in e-commerce or maybe uh, as affiliate marketers. So again, I see everyone rushing to do business on Amazon's platform, no site of their own, no distribution of their own. They're just like, why, why would I do all that? Oh, I'll tell you why. We now know that Amazon's been using the sales data from their merchant program to replicate their own products. So basically Mm. if it sells well and it's generic enough, you've got now the Amazon white label brand of that now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you not see that coming? If you've got a company that's that powerful and that ruthless, how do you not? Here's another one. And this one I know is causing a great deal of pain uh, among some of our friends and a lot of uh, marketers and entrepreneurs out in the digital space. But Amazon took the pandemic as an opportunity to finally cut commissions on their Amazon Associates program. Now, again, I've been waiting for them to just shut the damn thing down for a while because they don't technically need it. Now, I think, and I think even Amazon thinks that affiliates do provide a valuable source. I mean, again, this goes to the curation of products. There are a lot of business models that effectively educate the public and then make product suggestions. The wire cutter was probably one of the most famous examples that sold for 30 million uh, to the New York Times. But when I saw that happen, I'm like, man, you better put your resources behind moving away from Amazon or the wire cutter is going to become not all that valuable anymore. So they they didn't end the program. They're just going to cut the commissions down to a point where you're not going to eliminate those billions of links out there that are already pointing in to Amazon, but the money will never be the same again. The payouts will never be the same again. So 
That's another one. The, two examples. You're selling, you're doing e-commerce through Amazon. They're stealing your valuable data because they own the platform. And then they recommend their own version of your product ahead of theirs. And then we've got all the businesses that rely on Amazon uh, as a place for curated product recommendations. You get the commissions and those have been cut substantially. Again, this is what happens when you rely on someone else's platform. It seems smart because of all the traffic and all the people that are there, but you have to realize that the owner of the platform makes the rules and that's not you. Okay, so this is all very informative to kind of understand the larger trends, but I don't think anybody in this audience is going to build the next Amazon. Although if you are looking to build a 13 figure small you know, more power to you. <laughs> you know, this may not be the the show for you if you're trying to build something that big. But how does this work for the folks listening to this? For the folks who are at the seven figure small level? Yeah, when you, when you say platform, people have been kind of uh, trained or brainwashed to think Netflix, uh, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, right? And it, it's true, they are giant technology platforms. But so is a website combined with an email list because you control that website. And even though you use powerful software like ConvertKit or MailChimp uh, to conduct your email marketing, you still own that list, right? So that is a technology-driven, a WordPress website combined with uh, your choice of email marketing software is a defensible audience platform. It doesn't have to be outrageously expensive. And and think about it, Jared. I mean, think about the business we built with a WordPress site and an email list on on some good email software, right? Eight Mm -hmm. figures, three seven-figure businesses before that. So it doesn't have to be expensive. And the great thing is we, you and I, well, okay, you, you know, in the last week have we decided we wanted to be able to to have more flexibility with what we're doing. So just with basically off-the-shelf technology for WordPress, we're building a very powerful uh, transactional platform, right? I mean, and yet, yes, it's not free, but it's not outrageously expensive either. So I, I think that's where people have to understand that not only is a website plus an email list a defensible platform, the technology keeps getting better without getting more expensive. What about from a business model perspective, though? Because I mean, you know, yeah, okay, I put up a website, I've got my email list, okay, let's go. But now I've got to build the audience and then kind of take the next step and build a business around that audience. How should people be thinking about that right now, given everything that's happening? Yeah, I think uh, too often people confuse business model with revenue model. They're actually two different things. Your business model allows you to discover one or more revenue models. A a business model is basically a design for a successful business that allows you to identify the revenue sources that'll work, uh, develop successful products and services, and attract a customer base. But of course, that is a really, when you think about that description of a business model, that's the traditional product first model right? But what we do here is audience first. And an audience first business is exceptionally defensible. And it is it is your business model. Audience first is a business model. And some people uh, out there in our industry think this way. Uh, I know that Joe Polizzi and, and Robert Rose over at Content Marketing Institute, well, Joe is supposed to be retired, but he still is working. But anyway, their whole uh, killing marketing book really dove into the fact that this is not about content marketing. This is content as a business model. And I was like, and I, I got mentioned in that book because that's been our model. I was just like, hell yes, you get it, right? It's not about just marketing. It's an entire business model if done correctly right? Because with audience first, the way we teach it in seven figure small intensive, you build the audience by understanding who they are and intentionally attracting who you want. And then you discover 
what they want to buy. And then you figure out the revenue model that goes with it. And all of a sudden you have a successful business because you didn't do it the opposite way where you're like, I got this product idea and I think I should charge a recurring subscription for it. Now let me find some people who want to buy this. No wonder that fails so often, right? Mm -hmm. So right there, audience first is in my mind after think giving it way lots of thought. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't start a business any other way. Now I want to make clear here that I'm not calling traditional bricks and mortar businesses bad or other types of businesses. I mean, what would we do without them? I'm just saying I've never been drawn to starting one. I'm just, I mean, it doesn't play to my skill set as a, a writer and a content creator, but also the amount of money you can make with it, one of these, you know, small digital businesses is amazing compared to what you can make with a coffee shop because the audience scales without necessarily meaning that your business has to grow concurrently. It's incredibly powerful. To play devil's advocate for a minute, though, on this idea of audience first, there are a lot of media companies that are struggling with an audience first model. You know, I mean, I obviously, you know, as a hobby, you know, cover a sports team, but I see a lot of people who that's their job. And you look at newspapers that are just getting killed. And a lot of people who are in the audience game are struggling. So what's you know, what do you have to do if you're going to go audience first to make sure that you can actually succeed and, you know, build the revenue that you need? Because obviously some of these other models are sinking. They were already sinking and this is, had, has made it even quicker. Yeah. And again, this is something that causes me a great deal of concern. I mean, we need uh, responsible journalism. We need journalism that can support itself financially on the other hand, I did not create the model of traditional media, you know, um, the reliance on advertising. I, I tried to build a company uh, that relied on advertising exactly one time in 1998. It failed. I did, it just was hard. Um, and it's gotten harder. And yet we still see um, even, even uh, digital media startups that rely on advertising and sponsorships primarily, well, it's just, it's a tough business, right? Uh, original content creation and distribution is expensive. And yet you've got a business model or, or a revenue model from advertising that's falling apart. So it's just, it's not a defensible model. Uh, the, this, the indications are all there. I, I don't know what else to say about that other than I would never start one, but think about the flip side of what uh, one person can do, for example, with a curation model that's desperately in need because there's plenty of content, too little attention, too little trust. We need editors that can establish trust with an audience. And if you combine that with the product and service discovery aspects of serving an audience first, it'll reveal multiple revenue sources and therefore you have a more defensible business right there. You've got low overhead, but high potential because again, the audience can get bigger without you necessarily growing your organization. And that is obviously so attractive as a business model. We've got tons of case studies and friends who have done exactly the same thing uh, often using original content, because if you're a writer, you know, you are the means of production. Uh, but I, I'm fascinated with curation because I think it's almost more needed than we need more original content to become that trusted editor, right? So basically, small wins big if you have enough of an audience. And, and when I say the audience scales and you don't have to, it doesn't mean it has to be millions or hundreds of thousands of people, although we have plenty of examples of, of small companies that have done that. Oh. It just has to be enough to reveal what they want. And then once you start uh, being able to sell uh, that successful product or service, then you can make decisions based on revenue that's coming in, not, oh, I have a good idea about what people should buy instead of finding out what they actually want to buy. Yeah. 
Hey, I want to ask you one more question going back to the examples of Amazon and Airbnb because you know, and I wonder if there's a a lesson that can be extrapolated from this because you know, you you look at what's happened to those two businesses, right, with the pandemic. And it's like, oh yeah, of course that happened. You know, it's like yeah, you know, this totally affected global travel, of course this just killed what Airbnb is doing. You know, with Amazon, you know, people can't go out, they can't shop, they got to shop from home. Of course, this would skyrocket their business. And the thing is, you know, this whole idea of a pandemic, yes, the timing of it is always going to take you by surprise, but yet it's been predicted for a while that something like this was going to happen. Now, maybe something like this is just too nebulous, too out there, too unpredictable on the timing to actually plan for it. But if you're the CEO of Airbnb, you know, if you're Jeff Bezos at Amazon, is this something that you're thinking about? Like, do you think this was in their plans for, you know, contingency plans if this happens? You know, how are we going to take advantage of this if it happens when it's something that is somewhat predictable, even if you don't know the timing, but that's going to have such a just massive impact on their business model one way or the other? I think uh, if something like this benefits you, then you're not only thinking about it, but sadly, probably, I mean, if it's inevitable, it is. And this was, um, but I, I'm pretty sure Bezos knew that something bad was going to happen that would increase virtuality, <laughs> which is a weird kind of word, but I guess yeah. it makes sense. Uh, and that as dominant as Amazon is would make it more so. Uh, I would say the people at Airbnb are very bright people who had to think through catastrophic uh, scenarios about what could impact global travel and therefore impact their business. But I don't know how you defend their model. See, Amazon is basically a a hybrid company in, in that they take real stuff to real people from a digital platform. But like Uber, there are ways to interact digitally with the real world through automation and robotics. Um, But Airbnb's model was steeped in the oldest school of real world businesses, real estate, and also depended on, on the human beings who own that real estate. So now that you look at it, you're like, wow, I'm glad I never bought stock in Airbnb, even though I think it's a great service and I've used it uh, for my own benefit many times. It's just, there you go. I mean, uh, but again, if you're trying to think through how to start some massive VC funded tech platform, I think you're going to start getting these type of questions from VCs. Think about that, Jared, right? Yeah. This, you've got a whole new criteria of what they'll invest in and what not based on what they now know about a catastrophic scenario. But for, for people trying to make these seven figure small businesses, I think the best way to create one period is also the most defensible way to do it. So I have nothing against affiliate marketing, but don't do business with someone who doesn't need you. Find the companies that are going to welcome you as a partner to get the word out about their great products uh, that they don't have the benefit of being Amazon or, or some other major retail brand. So think that way. Who can you match up between your audience and uh, and 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 someone out there who has the right product or service in a way that makes everyone happy. We always talk about the win-win. You know, here you've got the win-win-win, and that's the way to think about it. Not the oh, I'm going to go do business with this platform that you know what ultimately doesn't need me, and when they don't need me anymore, I'm the one out on the street, or I'm the one who's going to have my uh, product cannibalized, or you know. I mean, you can't be too trusting. And I just think there's this inherent uh, decision-making process where people go, I'm going to start a business on this platform. And they're the ones who complain the loudest when the rug gets pulled out from under them. And I'm just going to have to say, you had to see that coming. Hmm. It's a good note to end on. Thank you for the insight as always, Brian. Any, Any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm I'm just uh, you know, it's uh I guess you can say that uh a bunch of introspection has been prompted by this whole situation. Most of it has not been around business. Um but 2 months in, my brain just started going to, you know, this is 
this is a worthy exercise uh, on the go forward because, you know, not everything's going to change, but a lot of things aren't going back the way they were. And I think a lot of that has to do with the acceleration of what was already happening. We got to see how it plays out. But I think people in our audience who are trying to build these type of businesses have nothing negative to come out of it because audience first is defensible. You can switch around uh, to different revenue models at the drop of a hat if something bad happens. And that's beautiful, right? Uh, So I'm just more bullish on the seven figure small uh, type business than ever because geez, losing your business and your livelihood is happening to far too many people right now. And that is not good. Yep. Well, thank you for being here and listening to this episode of Seven Figure Small. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of Seven Figure Small. Remember to take a moment this week, or heck, just do it right now, to sign up for Next Level 7, which is Brian Clark's free audio course that teaches you about how to lay the foundation for a defensible business like the one that we talked about in this episode. You'll learn what's working for attracting an audience and discovering what they want to buy, which are the first steps toward building a business that has the ability to adapt to changing economic times. To get started for free, go to nextlevel7.com. That's nextlevel7.com. Thank you.